The production of this video was made possible by donors to the Orchestration Online Patreon Initiative. Please consider adding your support to the creation of free educational internet resources by visiting our Patreon page linked below. Hey there, this is your orchestration tutor, Thomas Goss, bringing you one last look at the orchestral version of Lily Boulanger's piece, Dun Matin de Printemps, as published by the Internote Company, which very kindly gave me permission to use their printed edition. I divided the first two lessons along Lily's sense of form, with the first lesson covering the exposition of the themes, and the second lesson exploring the many different ways that the composer toys with her material. Throughout all of this, you've probably noticed that Lili scores with a very light hand, without overemphasizing any dynamics or emotional arcs, and yet still evoking a sense of profound wonder. In this last section, Lili is going to revisit some of her material and gradually increase the intensity of the music until the piece ignites in a glorious blaze of color before ending in a tiny wisp of smoke. Throughout it all, she maintains a strong sense of artistic determination and optimism, as if revealing one last time the strong creative impulses that drove her to compose hours of deliciously complex music in those precious moments of her life not spent in the sickbed. At figure 10, Lily recaps the opening, with flutes once again stating the theme over Col Legno strings. Around them dances Piccolo doubling Celesta in a swooping arc. First violins and harp introduce another arc behind the theme, then merge into the return of Celesta and Piccolo. This whole recapitulation abounds with such contrapuntal gestures, none of which appears in the duo score, another sign that the duo, trio, and orchestral versions were composed from the same sketches, rather than building on each other as progressive arrangements. The contrapuntal lines become so prominent in flute and bassoon at a double octave that they almost overshadow the featured oboe melody. Under this dazzle of voices, it's easy to overlook the charming doubling of harp and celesta that buoys up the texture, but it all gets enveloped very naturally back into the flouncing strings and bassoon at the end of the passage. Now Lily is going to try one more development of her main theme, that of a simple minuet-like variation played on heartfelt tenor register cellos. Once again, the composer innovates with her textures. Second flute and first clarinet play staccato thirds with flute below, possible only with dynamics this soft. This is doubled by sustained violas. First flute plays a little wandering melody over the top like a wisp of Arcadian panpipe while solo horn plays a major tenth over root fifths in double basses. Not satisfied with this, Lili adds yet another contrapuntal line in second violins. After eight bars, the cello melody dovetails seamlessly into Sol G first violins, not Sol C as written in the score, as does the horn line into the violas. This line is now firmed up a sixth below by a warm combination of first bassoon and bass clarinet. Meanwhile, the harmony becomes softly radiant in low flutes, harp harmonics, and second violins. Throughout this piece, Lily has shown us many sides of her personality, her charm, her keen intelligence, her sense of mystery and awe, even her nurturing side as we just heard. Now she's going to show us her sense of humor. From figure 12, we see just how adeptly she can kid around with the listener, by using only the themes and gestures she's explored up to now, yet slyly paying homage to the Sorcerer's Apprentice by Paul Dukas. The duo version spells out the functions very clearly, Repeated inverted minor major 7th chords leap down an octave and then resolve to dominant ninth flat 5 chords leaping up again. The left hand of the piano part adds a touch of support here and there, while the violin sweeps up, 
trills, and quotes bits of theme here and there to fill in as the excitement builds. This is interpreted quite sparsely at first in the orchestral version, with winds covering the staccato chords and strings the melody and support, but with more body to the trills and more oomph to the punctuation. As before, Lily simply swaps roles, with strings on staccato chords, winds playing sparse support lines, and horns covering the snatch of melody. As this trading game continues, the horns and then heavy brass become ever more prominent, with marching broomstick chords and sorcerous triplets. As I did in Lesson 2, I'm going to let this play a little bit past our analysis, so you can hear how the music pays off from this build-up. Finally, we hear Lily committing to a muscular tutti. But even here from figure 13, she's cautioning the winds, fortissimo but light, preventing them from mindlessly blasting those repeated staccatos. This is a triple unison, one player each per note from clarinet, oboe, and flute, with a single English horn playing E as a root to the suspended chord under those seconds. If the players obey their directions, then the low winds playing this low E fifth need absolutely no support from double basses or cellos. This frees up the cellos to double the horns hitting those marcato fifths, which Lili also instructs is to be played cheerfully, not heroically or aggressively. Not satisfied to simply transcribe the duo version, Lili adds yet another contrapuntal line in trumpets, once again fortissimo but light. Then there's this perfect combination of very high harp and triangle, which will cut through all the massive sound below it. Everything eloquently frames the triple octave strings that play the main theme one more time. Notice more sonic trickery at the third bar. The piccolo comes in doubling the first note of the first violins, and then plays the rest of the line in that register while the firsts drop an octave. This sounds so natural that the ear is fooled into thinking that the firsts actually did swoop up to a top E7. The tutti at figure 13 is such a perfect strategy that Lili essentially repeats it eight bars later when the melody and fifths return a whole step higher. But the harmonic framing is essentially the same, minus the harps and plus double basses supporting the lower winds. I find the four bars before this restatement more interesting, though, because it's much more perilous scoring. A single line of first violins playing the skipping little wrap-up to the theme, while pizzicato strings, first horn, marcato flutes, and grace-noted bassoons hit the chords on the way down. The other winds quickly reduce their repeated notes to a background rhythm, but then swoop all the way across the section. Notice how bass clarinets and oboes both play a key role in transitioning the runs across the instrumental groups. This is pushed from below by rising tremolo strings and accented heavy brass. The transformation is so enormous that it bears only a passing resemblance to the duo version. As I play the music with the score now, look for how Lili makes changes to the second appearance of this idea on the next page, for an even fuller sound, even though she's essentially leading to a much quieter passage. I love the way that Lili pulls the rug out from under the dynamic build right at figure 14, and suddenly drops down to a soft dynamic. Winds take over the octave melody, with first flute, both oboes, and first clarinet on top, and second clarinet plus English horn on the bottom. Pianissimo staccato violins and pizzicato violas and cellos complete the picture. On the next page, the winds thicken up a bit, as horn and harp bulk up the sound picture. Notice the second violins sweeping up to a position above the firsts. This is simply to enable the firsts to hit this motive hard without having to change fingering too much. From this point, the architecture changes drastically. Repeated notes trade off between lower winds and strings, and as each section takes over the roll, the opposite section grabs the motive. Octave first violins and violas are doubled by trumpets on the lower note, 
countered by arpeggios up to a triple octave of piccolo doubling flutes at the top, then oboes, then horns on the bottom. Turn the page, and now that Lily's got us near the edge of our seats, she's going to push us closer and closer to the brink. Brass and low winds hit hard on the downbeat, then immediately drop back to piano crescendo as both sections march outward in ever-expanding, seemingly unrelated chords, until snapping us back to E minor at the fourth bar. Meanwhile, the strings swoop down across their section in an octave run over the shifting harmony, and then sweep back up over an E Phrygian scale. Lily keeps the suspense at a premium with unlikely but very effective semitone trumpet trills on E. This is usually interpreted by conductors as a diminuendo right up to this wispy sixth on the harp, which is also modified into a downward slashing glissando just as in the piano part from the duo, though neither change is really indicated in the score. One last little bit of orchestrational leisure domain. Lily makes us think that we're hearing a full tutti, including winds, on the last chord, simply by fully voicing the brass on an E minor chord with triple stop strings. The overtones do the rest of the work. Du Matin de Printemps is an extraordinary work, because while Boulanger was definitely expressing her final thoughts on orchestral composition at this time, the work really does express all the vitality and optimism of a young genius in her prime. Lily fearlessly threw herself into the task with no looking back, and finalized, along with the sister piece, D'un Soir Triste, a creative legacy that's astounding in its scope, especially considering the enormously short time she had in which to compose. It wasn't just that she only had eight years of serious creative output from age 16 to her death at age 24. It's also that more than half that time she was too ill to work. And on top of that, she tended to throw away or abandon quite a few works that hadn't lived up to her expectations. And yet during that time she composed half a dozen large-scale works for chorus and orchestra, a prize-winning cantata, two song cycles, a respectable amount of chamber and solo works, and of course, her last two purely orchestral works. She was well into composing an opera before her health went into a final decline, and those sketches show that the work might well have provided a creative counterweight to the whole so-called Impressionist era, in bookending the harmonic and textural innovations that Debussy began with his opera Peleas et Melisande and perhaps leading to a new, more integrated approach that could be built on by other composers going forward. But we'll never know. I hope you enjoyed this look at Lily Boulanger's penultimate masterpiece. I intend to return to her orchestral works in this series until I've eventually covered them all. But for now, let's shift gears to a composer of the same period, but vastly different influences and approaches. Please join me next month, when we'll take a look at one of Rachmaninoff's greatest pieces of orchestration.